So on 30th of July, there was a major significance for ISRO as a major collaboration with NASA and we saw the launch of GSLV Mark II with NISAR satellite and we have project scientist Paul Rosen with us. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Would you like to say something about the satellite NISAR in particular because the design itself looked completely different from a conventional satellite? Sure, NISAR is a first-of-a-kind satellite. It has two very powerful radars, one built by ISRO, one built by NASA. By virtue of this design, we are able to make unique measurements of the Earth. It, because we have that large reflector, uh, it allows us to get a very wide swath, cover the Earth every 12 days from two vantage points, and all the land and all the ice-covered surfaces. So we are delivering data continuously over the mission, effectively making three-dimensional movies of the Earth that allow us to see changes of the ice sheets, of the sea ice, of forests, uh, and all kinds of natural hazards. It's a really powerful, powerful mission. Well, before talking to you, I had the ability, I mean, uh, we just spoke to a couple of school students who had come to uh, ISRO, and they were very much keen and interested to know about certain parts of it. And one was, SAR, what is synthetic aperture radar and how does it work? You can think of it as a combination between uh, a camera and a microwave oven. So we use microwaves, the radar wavelengths, to be able to make these measurements. But because these wavelengths are very long, when you send energy to the ground, it illuminates a very wide area, which is quite low resolution and maybe many kilometers. So you can't get a precise, sharp view of the Earth. We use the fact that the radar is flying along its orbit and sending out pulses of energy many, many times. So every point on the ground is imaged many times at this very low resolution. And by taking many of these uh, echoes along the track, we can combine them in a computer as though the antenna that we're using is 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers long. And that then means that we can get the resolution down to yeah, human scale size, high resolution, five to ten meters. It's a, it's almost magical technique, actually. That's why, because like you're you're using a ten or twelve meter wide reflector. Yes. But the distance would be almost ten to twenty kilometers. The, the the data we use to create a synthetic antenna is over is a collected over a ten kilometer to twenty kilometer uh, range along the orbit. So. Uh, Technically, a camera uses a lens to focus energy into a single point. Reflected energy from Earth. Reflected art. energy from the Earth. And this radar is using essentially all of these pulse, pulses along the track and adjusting them uh, in the computer as though it's focusing it through a lens so that we get the sharp resolution. And why is it much better than an optical uh, imaging of Earth? Well, optical images, of course, have their, uh, their function. Uh, they are sensitive to the chemical properties of what's going on on the Earth. Radar is fundamentally different from that. It can see through the clouds, it can see day and night, so it provides complete reliable coverage at all times. So it's excellent for the cases where you might absolutely require it independent of weather and smoke and that kind of thing. For, think of a, a forest fire or a natural disaster where there's cloud cover and you absolutely want to have those measurements. It's great for that. In addition, these radar frequencies are sensitive to different things. They're sensitive to the uh, electrical properties, the water content, as well as the detailed shapes at the, at the scale of the wavelength. So we're actually imaging through a completely different set of eyes, an invisible part of the spectrum. That's what my next question from another student though. So the question was, will we see the image in red, green and blue or will it be like an optical image? Will there be any difference, the so, image generated? So the answer is no and yes. So we don't actually see those frequencies. We're actually measuring invisible frequencies above the red Spectrum, color huh? in the rainbow. So if you imagine a rainbow in the sky, our frequencies are invisible way above that. However, when we display the data, what we typically do is take both the L and the S band, which are two different colors, they're two different frequencies, we also take the polarimetric information, just like Polaroid glasses can uh, orient and remove certain kinds of light, we can use polarization to understand the structural properties on the ground as well. 
So by combining the polar metric and frequency information into a false red and a false green and a false blue, we can create color images that are telling us something different from what an optical image would. would and why was an S band and L band, a dual frequency radar was used in uh, NISA? Well, it's always great to have more frequency content. Uh, and for example, in the optical domain, they go from a single uh, channel panchromatic to a multispectral with multiple channels to a hyperspectral with thousands of channels. Ideally, we would do that with radar as well. Uh, typically, radars are large instruments and often involve the entire spacecraft. So uh, it's more difficult to get lots of frequencies. So we're starting with two. This is the first time that two radars have been flown in space in a free-flying mission for the life of the mission uh, and operating simultaneously. So it's a really unique uh, capability. Not just that, the satellite itself is unique considering the boom has to unfold itself and then the antenna has to expand or unfurl. That's Almost right. like an origami uh, kind of uh, tech, uh, design that you've used over here. How did you, what, you know, finalize on this particular design and how much work was put on it? Uh, well, we've been working on this project for almost what is it, 11 years now. So, and before that, we were doing many different studies. Uh, NISAR derived from previous studies, there was a mission concept called Desdeny in the United States. And during the Desdeny period, which was before NISAR, we went through a set of uh, design trades where we looked at the conventional kind of antenna to the kind that we have now with the reflector and then a, a feed system on the spacecraft. And we determined that this new design would allow us to get more capability, more re higher resolution and wider swath at the same time uh, over the conventional systems. So we went down this path and once we made that decision that this was the right thing to do, then we uh, had to figure out how to construct it. And that wasn't done in great detail until we had our partnership with ISRO because it was highly dependent on the spacecraft design, the and bus, the, and the everything. bearing, the fairing, and everything like that. So, it it was a it, the process is highly iterative. We have a concept, we flesh it out on paper, we talk about it, we uh, do some analysis, and then we say, well, that doesn't quite work. Let's try something else. And so that process takes a couple of years, iterating with our uh, ISRO partners. And then we come up with a design, it gets reviewed and certified that this is the right way to go and it, we, can, we can achieve it in a technical sense. And then we proceed that way. And it's, it's a multi-layered uh, iteration. It's going to take eight days for it to turn operational, right? Uh, so it, it depends on what you mean. We are turning on various subsystems over the first 30 days. It's going oh. to be 30 days before, well, 20 to 30 days, somewhere in that range before the radars are actually turned on and operational. The deployment of the boom and the reflector, that's going to be from day 10 to day 18, oh, okay. 17. Oh. Yeah. So it's going to be stationed at 747 kilometers from Earth? That's right. So coming to the, as the launch is a success and it has been stationed in the uh, right altitude, what is NISAR going to look for? Uh, scientifically, it's, NISAR is going to look for uh, many things. Uh, it has specific requirements on the U.S. side in studying ice sheets and sea ice and their interaction with the ocean and the atmosphere. It's going to be looking at forest cover and forest use uh, change as well as uh, disturbance, agricultural changes and uh, crop health as well as wetland uh, and inundation studies. These radars are very well suited to those kinds of measurements to understand the carbon cycle and understand better applications such as forest and, and crop management. We're also studying solid earth and natural hazard. As I mentioned before, NISAR has this all-weather day-night capability. And in the event of disasters, we can, uh, as soon as we fly over, we can get reliable information, compare that information to what happened before, and actually come up with a, uh, a measurement of where uh, destruction or damage may have occurred quite precisely and past systems that are not quite as capable of NISAR have already demonstrated this capability. Scientifically, we're studying earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, other natural hazards to understand better 
their mechanisms and understand potential ways to forecast risk better for the public. Does that mean NYSAR is going to play a very important role in carbon emission and its effect on climate change? Yes, one of the larger, um, one of the larger error sources in the carbon cycle is the above ground biomass variability. So one of our main objectives is to measure that variability, reduce the error bar, and help carbon modelers to understand that exchange. Earlier you have said that NYSAR has the ability to even uh, identify millimeter level changes when it comes to the Earth's surface. Yes. A micro level which can be used, like what unfortunately happened yesterday, uh, the 8.2 Richter. Absolutely. We have the ability using, NYSAR has the ability using a technique called uh, radar interferometry to measure changes in the position of the Earth down to millimeters to centimeter scale, depending on the area and other conditions. We do this by using the wavelength of the radar as a yardstick, effectively. We fly over once, measure the, the Doppler distance. Doppler kind of thing. It, it's actually a direct measurement of the phase change. Uh, we, we, me we measure an image. We come back again 12 days later and measure a, an image from the same vantage point. And by basically taking the difference of these images, which are complex images, we have a magnitude and a phase, that phase change, which is very precise, can be used to measure the motion of the Earth down to you know, millimeters, millimeters or centimeters. So we do these maps, and they are used in, by scientists to model what happened from before to after an event. Uh, in the case of the earthquake yesterday, we would have been able to map the precursor earthquake, which was, I think, an order of uh, magnitude seven or above earthquake before the largest one. We would have seen that earthquake, done some modeling, and tried to understand what the potentials for the next earthquake might be. And maybe um, we could at least understand where the potential for the earthquake would be. Timing of earthquakes forecasting is quite difficult. So, uh, but Nonetheless, every piece of information is extremely important when lives are at risk. Uh, <clears throat> any reason why we have a 12 days interval and uh, will these data be available for the uh, global scientific community? Yeah, so the 12 day interval is uh, one of these engineering trades that we had to do uh, with the scientists and the engineers. Sci if you ask a scientist how often they would like data and at what resolution, they'll tell you Give it to me as soon as I can get it, uh, as quickly as possible, sampling every day, and give me the finest possible resolution. And when you have uh, limits on your uh, overall design space, you can't give them always that. So by looking at uh, a, d a number of trades, looking at the science, looking at the requirements for what they needed to push the envelope on, uh, on understanding the Earth one step further, which is generally recommended by the global community. They say, these are our big ch challenges, this is what we want to do. So by looking at those requirements, and then let's, uh, let's think about, does that need to be a 12-day repeat, or a 24-day repeat, or an eight-day repeat? You chose the least. We choose, we choose the one that, that optimizes the science for the uh, available resources that we have in terms of what we can launch, and what the cost is. And finally, how was the collaboration with uh, uh, ISRO? It was fantastic. I, I can tell you, as a scientist, I just had nothing but fun working with our Indian colleagues at all the different centers at ISRO. We, uh, we could share with each other our science goals and our applications goals. The program at ISRO is very highly developed in taking data from science into applications NASA tends to focus on more global science and doesn't always go all the way to the applications in every case. So we learned a lot from that end-to-end uh, that -end capability at ISRO, and I think ISRO has been uh, pleased with the interaction with us where we tend to focus on these global problems. Oh, I can vouch for that. We are yeah. very happy to have you here, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And about future collaborations with ISRO? Yes, I, w I welcome it. <laughs> Do you have any plans? Uh, we, have, we, we don't have any definitive plans at the moment. This is something that NASA and ISRO at the level above me would talk about, not so much me. Uh, but you'd but be very interested. I would be very interested personally as a scientist and, uh, and a team member to continue the collaboration as long as we can. We've only really started the mission right now, even though it's taken 11 years to get here. Next uh, five years. The next five years and hopefully beyond, we'll be, we'll be working with ISRO to get 
wonderful data. And after the first year or two, we may change the minds of everybody in the world that this is, must be continued into the into the future. future. Maybe, maybe not, but we'll see. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, very My nice pleasure. meeting you as well. That was Paul Rosen, the science uh, the uh, behind NISA, a satellite that was launched with a collaboration from ISRO and NASA, and it is definitely going to play a major role in providing data and thereby saving a lot of lives. With Daniel from Odmadar, Point Today.